And when we're finished with that, we're going across to Marion Peacher. You know her. I think she spoke here before of Targusk. She'll be looking at labour and some labour studies she has done, as well as other aspects of labour. So it's really all around the team of labour. So Liam or Catherine, whichever one you want, you go first. And I'm pronouncing their name exactly right. I'm in type Mellorick. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, where's my dad? Let's see. Let's see. Uh, we're talking this morning on the benefits of once a day milking, how once a day milking works for us. Um, <clears throat> we, are, we are milking 121 crossbred cows near Federal County Tipperary. Um, we are farming 200 acres in one block divided by a small rural road and a third of our farm is rented. Uh, we've just completed five years, once a day, full season. And in 2012, we milked 69 cows twice a day, and we sold 394 kgs of milk solids. And in 2018, we milked 121 cows once a day, and we sold 417 kgs of milk solids. Um, we both left school in 1983. Um, we met in 1985, Catherine and myself met in 1985, uh, through Mochran and Ferma, and we got married in 1995. And at that time, Catherine's father signed over half the farm to us, and we bought the herd of cows from him. And um, we entered into a 50 50 partnership and with, John, with John, and that lasted until 2010 when he passed away. Um, next slide, yeah. Um, uh, one, once a day, uh, we read somewhere where could, w could we make as much once a day as twice a day? So further investigation was, requ was required. We got interested because of the lifestyle benefits. Um, research told us that Jersey crossbred cows would be the best for once a day, but we had a black and white herd at the time. Uh, we visited Frank Buckley in Moore Park, where they were doing a trial on three-way cross in uh, Kilworth. But um, we looked at them and we decided that they were going to be, the cow was going to be too big for what we wanted. So we suggested to Frank that we, would, we were going to go Jersey Cross and uh, he was saying if we were going to use Jerseys, to use a purebred Jersey and cross the whole herd with that. So we done that and in 2011 we had our first crossbred calves on the ground and at that stage anyone that knew that we were going crossbred thought we were going mad and that was before we even mentioned we were going once a day. Um, we had good mentors in uh, Dornlow Lachlan and um, Newcastle and Michael Wall, Gillian and Neil O'Sullivan from Dungarvan who were already once a day for a few years. And uh, also Brian Hillard from Tagus and Dungarvan and our own Tagus advisor Sandra Hayes and Torlis, they were, uh, any time I had any queries, they were good to come back to us as well. Um, Uh, preparation for once a day, is it? Yeah. Uh, in 2010, we were milking 60 cows twice a day, so more facilities were needed if we wanted to increase cow numbers. Uh, 2011, we we um, converted a slow flow shed that was for cattle for and put in cubicles for in calf heifers. In 2013, we were milking in an eight unit milking parlour, so we doubled that up to an eight unit doubled up, and we put in cluster removers and cluster cleans. And we also put in feeders and a meal bin. Uh, in 2014, 
Uh, we also put in an auto washer as well into the milking machine that year as well. And 2014, we put in a tower liquid mineral system to put minerals and magnesium and bloat oil in the water for the cows. Um, and to, well, bloat oil because we had a group of clover in the swards. And we'd be producing meal, we weren't going to be feeding as much meal to the cows. So we target that to the times of the year that we want it. And it's working fairly well. And in 2015 slash 2016, then we put up a new slatted tank in the cow yard where there was an old open tank. And we also built a shed that we could put cubicles into as we expanded. And so we have some cubicles in that at the moment. And we have we used the rest of the shed for storage, for hay and straw. And we have an area for peat that we put the cows on that are near cabin, maybe four or five days in cabin. And they can be uh, nice. We do nighttime feeding for them, and that works very well. Um, the, the first five years, um, our first year wasn't worked out better than we expected because it was a good price year. Um, that was our last year with any male cattle on the farm, and from then on, we have only three groups of animals to make it more streamlined. We only have cows, in calf heifers, and calves. And we also had very good fertility in the first year. We only had 2% empty, but we, we culled 10 to 15% during the year that weren't suitable for, for, um, for once a day. Uh, the challenges of once a day are no different to challenges of twice a day, but more attention to detail is needed in once a day, in our opinion. Uh, some of the challenges there would be that, well, I suppose they could happen to any place. Um, 2014 there we had stray current and uh, we thought it was in the milking parlour. We had a high cell count due to that but as it turned out it wasn't, it was outside the milking parlour and it wasn't even where the cows were travelling. Um, we had um, in 2015 then we had an outbreak of mycoplasma bovis and we had to cull 10% of the herd for that. And in 2016 was a poor milk price year and our average price for that year was 32.3 cents a litre. And in 2017, we had a virus in the cows and we blood tested and done swabs and milk samples and everything like that and turned up all negative. So we decided we would uh, vaccinate for IBR tw every six months and that kind of sorted that. And for 2018, then was an extreme year. We had waste and snow and droughts and an expensive year. And other challenges there as well would be over-conditioned cows when they're dry and that brings its own problems in in the spring when the cows are calving with milk fever, etc. And uh, yeah, um, I have a co-op performance report up there. Um, in, two, in 2012 to 2015, there it includes um, some dry cow. Dry cows were included because they were on the farm. Um, this, is a, this is an ICBF report. Um, in 2015, their production was up 20% milk solids per cow. In 2016, it was up 12%. Uh, 2017, there was only up 2%, which was disappointing. Uh, no real reason for that. In 2018, we were up 10% more, and probably our best year so far since we went once a day. And well, also, it was our best year for feeding meal as well. Um, so that's basically me. I'll hand you over there to Catherine. Thank you. Breeding. <clears throat> we do a maximum of 10 weeks uh, breeding, um, all AI. Um, we use tail paint on the cows, just ordinary mat emulsion, <clears throat> one odd colour, um, and we put this on with a radiator roller um, in the parlour. Um, we consistently have achieved 90% plus um, calved in six weeks, especially since we went once a day. Um, for the last five years. Uh, previous to that, we would have been fairly, fairly good, anyway, 75 to 85, but we're constantly over uh, the 90%. Um, all AI is done uh, by lean. Um, only the top 70% of the cows get dairy AI, and only for five weeks. And then there's five weeks of Hereford AI. 
When it comes to the EBI, we tend to reverse the, um, the milk fertility weighing within the EBI. Um, what we kind of aim for is maybe a milk sub-index of <coughs> maybe 70 or 80, and the fertility will be 40-50. Um, we don't ignore the fertility. Um, and other traits that would be ranked very high. Uh, obviously, the, the milk soy index comes from milk solids produced, uh, so we're looking for that um, plus 30 or, or, or plus. Um, other support is a very, very important. If you haven't that, uh, waste of time. Um, negative on, on somatic cell count and maybe positive on body condition score, they would be the traits that we would look for in, in when picking bulls. Um, some of the purebred bulls that we've used in the past, um, SYI, OKM, PKA, JE 4289, and we, uh, Danish bull there, um, S2089. Some of the Kiwi Cross, PSQ, FR2213, YMD, KZA, and uh, NPY. And, and some of the Frisians that are done quite well, FR 2089, YKG, AYD, and an outstanding bull for us has been SOK. Um, when we, when we came in first, we had, we had 40% we had 40 heifers in our first year, and there was uh, eight or nine SOKs, and we actually tried to sell them in 2013 because they thought they would be suitable going forward. Um, we didn't try very hard, thank God, and they turned out to be absolutely super cows that are doing 650 kgs of milk solids um, um, on, on once a day, just, but they are quite big and make excellent donor cows. We love seeing heifers off of these, these group. Uh, our policy uh, at the minute is going forward is using Holstein Frisian on mostly Jersey. By mostly Jersey, we need, uh, uh, that's 60% plus uh, Jersey, we'll get um, um, a Frisian, Holstein Frisian, and, um, and Jersey on mostly Holstein Frisians. But there's not too many of those there in the herd at the minute. Uh, breeding for the future. Um, We've recently purchased um, Dairy Master Moo Monitor collars for our heifers for the coming season. There's a lot of work keeping scratch cards right on the heifers. Um, between the first three eggs, too bad, but after that, you, you're bringing them in and you're picking out. And we look at the heifers three times a day. They're slightly different compared to the cows. The cows are only looked at once a day. Um, and they're seen once a day in the morning, they're eyed once a day in the morning, and that's it. We don't do any other heat, heat detection on the cows. But with the heifers, we like to do on standing heat, so they're seen about three times a day, and we usually try to have them near the house. And um, you're just running them in and out, and we have no AI, or, no, or sorry, no bull or anything like that, so our vasectomized bull of any description, so it's just AI. And uh, we just find it time consuming, so we're hoping this will um, help us uh, going forward. And it'll also probably help us if we decide down the line to use sex semen as regards time in our AI. That we'll know at the breakfast table, all oh, right, um, there's um, two cows um, for AI today, and that's it. And it's a lot of pressure on going off looking and watching and seeing. And each year isn't she or this. So time will tell whether uh, a wise move or not. Um, Going forward, like I said, we think um, sex semen could play a big role. It probably needs more improvement as regards conception rate, um, but it's, it's going in the right direction. Um, another option maybe might be to breed um, ragu beef from our crossbred herd, or um, up to now, most of our sires have been all A2, mostly A2, 90% of the sires we use at the minute are A2. Maybe we should use all A2. And it might be another opportunity down the road. Um, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't cost us anything. Um, it might be a bit of a hope factor. All these things need further investigation. Uh, we have separate uh, bull and heifer calf sheds. Um, no one answers the heifer shed, only uh, Lima and myself. Um, up to now, we've never failed to sell a calf. And uh, hopefully that will continue going forward. Uh, we have regular customers for our heifer crossbred calves and our in-calf heifers. So, is it true that you can make as much once a day as twice a day? Our answer is yes, but careful planning and patience is required. Chart 1 gives a breakdown of the 2017 profit monitors compared to our results. The analysis is based on 1,336 farms. Um, this is for 2017. We're the yellow, the average is the grey, and the blue is the top 25%, which is 
where we aim to be in the not too distant future. Um, and 2017 was a good milk price year, so it's going to be very hard. We're never going to be as good as um, a twice a day farmer when there was a very high milk price. But if the milk price drops and down, down on the floor, which hopefully won't happen too often, uh, that's where we will gain. Um, every year we have to make money, irrespective of a milk price. Uh, full stop, that's it. We have to make money. Um, so we don't really worry about the milk price as such. The biggest concern for us is a healthy herd, and a healthy herd will deliver profits. Um, we're seven cents above the top 25% there as, as regards gross output milk price, and we're eight cents above the average. For the last five years, we've generally been seven cents plus um, above the co op average anyway. So, a combination of that and the total variable costs are lower, and fixed costs being lower gives you a respectable um, net profit per cow. Um, over the whole farm, we were talking uh, 2014 there, over all of the whole farm uh, net profit. Now, that includes everything bare our own labour um, and, and has to be taken out of that. Um, now, okay, 2017 was a good year, so moving forward, what about last year? Take it handy on the take, Mary. <laughs> I felt I couldn't keep up with the speed of them. <laughs> They're only trying to put you off because oh, we're no, going no, so I, well. So I'm relaxed now, I don't mind. That's what you call intimidation before the event, like. I could say something, but I won't. <laughs> Now we're right. Okay, 20, um, 2018, um, uh, milk soils produced up uh, 422, um, gross output similar to, to, to 2017, uh, back two cents on the gross output per litre, but our variable costs uh, jumped almost 50%. Um, uh, Fixed costs much the same, and our net profit last year was 816, which is quite respectable. Over the whole farm, you've gone from 2,000 back 350, um, we were happy, um, happy enough. So considering the year it was in it, um, we, we fared out pretty well, I think. Grass. Grass is measured every 10 days or uh, every five days at peak. Um, we recorded figures on pasture base and have for the last um, three years. In 2017, we grew 12 tonne. Well, this was back to uh, 8.2 tonne in 2018. Um, that's using about 100 kgs of nitrogen per hectare, which would be normally our normal use, which would be about 80 units uh, an acre thereabouts. Uh, it's a quite a dry farm, um, and our normal grazing season extends from um, early February to early December. Our average meal feeding, feeding, we try to keep it under about 250, but last year uh, we fed about 950 and uh, every kind of a concoction. And like a speaker said yesterday, we discovered um, Pam Kernel. It's a great thing. Uh, we went all bales in uh, 2006 and have been since. Uh, we just love bales. Um, it's, you haven't a feast or a famine. You always have grass that's there ready to be grazed. Uh, and and there's, you know, there's after grass coming into the system the whole time. The whole farm is cut at least once. And uh, we normally start cutting mid-May um, to, and we try to be finished up in a normal year uh, the first few days in, in August is the last of us cut. And after that, then we're building grass. Uh, we tend to be able to keep the cows out fully right up to the 1st of December in, in, a, in a normal year. Um, a typical day outside of breeding and calving, we usually we up at six, kind of old habits die hard. Uh, breakfast, out the doors, half six, lean goes with the cows, arranges the next break. Um, I'd start milking, uh, cups on at seven, we're back at the parlour, and then one of us uh, look at the calves or the in calf heifers. One washes out the parlour, the other scrapes the yards and locks out the cows. We're back at the house, then at nine or half nine, depending on where they are, uh, for a cup of tea. And as far as we're concerned, our day is done uh, farming wise, if, if we so wish, otherwise, we, we plan the rest of our day. Um, we really love what we do and are very happy doing it. And we'd have no problem uh, going to matches or games, say, with our daughter Lisa, or, you know, if there was something on or anything. If the weather is nice, 
uh, like it was last year on the hot days, uh, are too hot to work, head for the beach. If it's wet, for sure, light the fire, read the farmer's journal. Um, any meeting we go to is no bother, and uh, especially our own Pody discussion group, we're, remember, measure, we're members of a couple of um, discussion groups, and Pody is uh, pioneering once a day in Ireland. They're the once a day, and they're kind of covering all of Ireland, there's 25 of us. Uh, we meet four times a year, and um, once is um, indoors, and the other three are on farms. So those farms can be anywhere in Ireland. So there are three or four hour meetings, and they're a social event, and there's dinner then afterwards as well. It's nice also to stay at a job and not be clock watching and say, oh, I have three now, right, oh, close up shop and, and um, cows to be done and that's it. So, you know, uh, we might be uh, maybe more inside or bringing in stuff. Uh, we do all our own machinery work, I forgot to say that earlier on, uh, except baling and wrapping. Um, we do everything else in-house. Uh, we cut, tid, bale, bring in, reseed, uh, whatever to be done, we do ourselves, head cut and the whole lot. Um, but if we are under pressure, we will get in someone to, to help out if the weather is bad. Last year now, we got caught and the weather was bad and we just had to get someone in to give us a hand with a story spread. Um, so it's nice not to be, yeah, that you're not watching the clock and you can finish up whenever you like. Um, we should also mention that neither of us work outside the farm. We are full-time farmers. Uh, we depend on those 120 cows um, for our income and that's it. Uh, this is our um, flagship cow, um, 785. She's a first cross, uh, six lactation. She has a heifer calf every year and she does 600 kgs plus. Um, she's just um, an exceptional cow. She also has her own Twitter account. <laughs> um, once, once a day, I'll just finish up with this now. Once a day, it's not for everyone, right? It's, it's, a, it's an option. It suits some, it doesn't suit others. And that's grand, there's plenty of room for us all. Uh, and it's really, really hard work uh, trying to share out seven milkings a week. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
we should wait. We should wait to get poor quality silage to feed for the winter for the dry cows. Like. It was, it, was, it was one of the things that was very hard at coming off of twice day. When you're twice day, you, you know, you always thought, make your best possible silage. You have cows and you need to build condition. But to have them to sit and wait, and, and you know you need something down around 60 DMD, otherwise they just pile on. Once these cows go dry, the following day they're gaining weight. So they have to be restricted. You can't just horse in stuff into them or they'll be fat as fools. And, and, you know, so uh, this year we use a 2017 hay with a lot of hay, and, and they're only on silage for the last week. Uh, or cows just, and because they're three or four weeks. Um, don't, don't ever be stuck though for 60 DMD silage. No, I no, can have like plenty of it for you. Don't, don't. You're, 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 yeah. yeah um, sorry, uh, David Williams, North Wales, where once a day milking as well. Uh, yeah, David Williams, North Wales, where once a day milking as well. Uh, you, your chairman, being so efficient and effective as he normally is, he's already covered the points I was going to raise. Uh, condition is never an issue with once a day and if you're making silage to maintain your grazing platform it's really too good to winter cows on so uh, old situation we usually buy hay in and uh, to feed them over the winter and we have a higher stocking rate uh, to consume as much grass as possible but uh, very impressive figures thank you just um, just say that uh, at, at the minute we're kind of only um, really taken over. We have, you know, we were there, okay, the plan is, our milking parallel will probably come on forward to kind of work up to maybe 140, 150. But after that, an 80 minute double up is going to take too long. Three hours milking is, is long enough for, for, for us. So then we said, well, do we want to milk 150? I mean, we're, we're quite happy. We can let the herd mature. We have been bringing in, I mean, last year we had 27% replacement rate, we had 34 the year before. So I'd just like to see the herd mature a bit and, and see how we go from there. We have the accommodation, we have the slurry storage, we can move on. Um, but whether we want to make more work for, us, for ourselves is another thing. Um, how are you managing cell count or how do you issues with cell count when you switch first? Um. Um, cell count. Um, you just cannot let it get out of control. Um, the, the first year, we, we, we couldn't understand um, in June uh, on the milk record uh, with 40 heifers in and their cell count was 400. They hadn't massaged, but their cell count was 400. We had changed the machine uh, the previous October and everyone was saying, oh, it's your machine, your machine is wrong, something wrong. We were blue in the face and uh, they came up from Kerry, they looked at it, uh, we had independent guys in and they said, no, no, it's just perfect, it couldn't be, you know. And eventually what, how we discovered it was the milkman coming in, we have electric gate coming into the farm. Uh, it tripped one, and he said, I can't get in. And we said, no, the current is, current is it's not off like it's, it's there. So uh, it's only after that, it was um, a lead cable crossing the yard. There wasn't where there was no cow. So I reckon they were picking it up uh, out in the collecting yard on the slats or something before they came in. There was nothing in the parlor, but just that tiny little thing. It was only, it was very, very small. It was rectified. It was too late in the year. It was September before we actually copped it. And um, it, um, uh, we just uh, rectified itself the following year. We just had to, a longer dry period and uh, that started. The following year then, the mycoplasma, um, we got that and that, that really kind of played havoc. Um, uh, we got the mastitis and the pneumonia end of it and nothing else. And we got it in early March. It was, it was desperate now. We just had to call and anything that got it, we called it. We, did, we didn't keep them. Um, so that brought on, uh, we had a bit of strahorus there and we had this kind of a hope factor that we had some cows that we should have called and we didn't call and we're there, ah, sure, they'll be grand. And uh, they weren't grand. They were grand for two months. Next thing, they were back to their old tricks again. So, struck ours in the herd. Even though we had the cluster flush, it probably saved a lot of cows, I'd say. But um, you really just have to keep on top of it. Anything at high cell count, uh, an extra long dry period, um, use a dry cow. We haven't, we're not using selective dry cow at the, we didn't this year, we did last year uh, with a small percentage of the herd. But, um, uh, I'll be a bit slow now until we're really right on top of things uh, before we, we'll try it again. I hope that answers your question. So um, it seems to me at the moment you've got the perfect system, like you're doing 420-ish kilos of milk solids per cow. But in the initial couple of years, you took a bit of pain in terms of production per cow fell. Maybe you overcame some of that by increasing cow numbers. But let's say you're on a, a static, you couldn't increase cow numbers. So production was going to fall by 20%. What are, have you any tips for overcoming, we say, the, the financial burden of that? Um, well, I'd say if you could go once a day on a good meal price year, it would probably help. 
number one. Um, you, have to, you kind of have to be prepared to take a heat, like you're going to take a heat on the first year, no matter what you do. And you're dealing with what sort of a hit? Like we all talk about being down um, maybe 25% in volume, but milk price goes up. So in terms of cash revenue in, does milk price stay the same? You could be talking about maybe, I suppose, on, we'd say on our herd, there are 100 cows, we were probably back 25, 26,000, I'd say, the first year. But then we were back up 20% again the following year, like. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we were increasing every year after that. Like, and like I said, we were we had a good few heifers coming in every year, and we were increasing the numbers. So, like, if we only if we st if we only increased the first year, or you know, um, we probably would have came up faster to where we are now. The biggest thing now is we know exactly which cows suit the system, and we're breeding off of those. Whereas in the beginning, it just every cow just got bred for dairy AI because we hadn't a clue what was going to suit. There's no there's no one going to say, right, say, what, what cow, we'll get asked the whole time, what cow suits once a day? You haven't a clue until you actually put them once a day and see, you know. Um, so it's all trial and error. There's no, there's no kind of, you know, you can't be asking more power because there's, no, there's nothing done really there as such up to now anyway. Um, so you just have to see. Um, the, condition, the, the difference in our heifers at the minute and five years ago is, is 100 kilos. Um, they make recorded about 250, but heifers will kick on. Uh, this year, they're, they're over 360, the average for the heifers. Now, that's a big jump. Um, so you'd be expecting a heifer around 300 kilos, second lactation, 400 kilos, and definitely a mature, a mature cow by third lactation should be doing 500 kilos once a day. And if not, there's something wrong, she should be out the gap. You know, so, so we'd like to see a cow milking her weight once a day. That's our perfect cow. We don't want her doing massive yields either. We have one, uh, one of our SOKs did over 700 this year. You know, it's fifth or sixth lactation, which is excellent order. And you're looking at her, you'd say she was only a fat suckler. But she, I know where she had it, but she, she, she really, really did well now. That, that would be on 250, 260 kilos. We'd be kind of the meal we'd want to use. Like. <clears throat> um, just a question on your costs. Um, in comparison like, to the top 25% of your chagas, you're, you're saving yourself almost 200 euros. Can you focus and tell us where those savings are coming, please? Um, well, um, we, um, we're, we're milking this. Um, we, we milk on nitrate electricity. Um, you, you only wash the machine once. Um, we, we, um, and our variable costs, we, we, like we're fairly, we feed all year round, even though we only feed less than 250. Uh, you know, we, we'll go uh, point two, kind of, our cow flow wouldn't be great within the yard. So um, that's a saving there. Uh, fertilizer, um, our fertilizer costs are quite low, but it's mostly a kind of um, PK and lime, a kind of, you know, that's where the fertilizer comes. Um, the nitrogen end of it isn't big. Um, the fact that we're not overly stocked and um, we can have a debate of, right, are we going with 12 units or 15 units? Where someone else will say, oh no, bag and a half and that's it. You know, um, and they say, oh, you're wasting diesel, but I don't think so. We will match, um, depending on growth rate, the amount of nitrogen that we spread, and whether we need surfaces or not. And we always, we've never run out of silage. We have bought stuff uh, in 2018, but we bought stuff, uh, like buying, buying silage in the middle of summer is uh, totally unheard of. Um, you know, so we'd always in 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 was it 2013 was another bad year. Uh, we had I think we had four or five bales left. Uh, we had plenty of fodder there, but it was a the wrong type of fodder that we had. And there in August we just said, we like here we'll go buy stuff. Um, it'll be, you know, save tax time and, and peace that. Of mind. Uh, yeah, peace of mind. It'll be there. Yes. Any thoughts on your veterinary? Like uh, a, a, veterinary compared uh, to the the average. Outcome. Uh, no, our veterinary can be kind of high enough because you have all your vaccinations in, in that as well. Um, uh, which, you know, we vaccinate for, for every, anything we can, you know, BVD, Lepto, Salmonella. Um, you just don't want any of those things. You get any of those things into your herd and you can say it might only affect maybe five or six cows, but you're talking at least 10 or 15,000 across the herd, um, you know, uh, un, un, unknown to yourself, that kind of thing. Um, so. Uh, really try to keep um, a healthy, happy herd and um, a cubicle each and feeding space all can each at the one time and this kind of thing, so. Um, no stress, 
Low stress as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the uh, name, Catherine, Catherine the, um, would you have any problem with blown bags in the herd? We'll say that, uh, you know, yields of over 400 kgs of milk salads, it's, it's a great yield and once a day. Can, are, are the bags standing up to it over time? We'll say that. Well, um, we wouldn't have much recourse to the banks. We're at a stage where we're kind of debt free and that, so anything we do, you know. Huh? Sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. Others. 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 I thought you said banks. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. sorry. Um, there mightn't be a big difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, as my colleagues in the but financial the others, sector the down there. Lasting, oh, yeah. Others, Other, uh, we know we have only, at the minute, there's only one cow with a bad order. We, ha we, we had good orders before we started, and we'd always be conscious of, um, yeah. I read for orders. Um, so I there's one at the minute. I think, yeah. Um, so ideal cow, 25, 26 litres, and to do it long enough, and at nine and a half, ten percent solids. <laughs> when, and that's the, when you're selecting bulls, would you be looking at suspensory ligament? Would you? Oh, definitely. Def You'd be looking a bit stronger. De yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. Order support um, definitely has to be strong. Uh, wouldn't use a bull other than that. And we have used wolves that would be kind of, cows that would be kind of a little bit iffy. And there's some bulls there that are extremely strong for other support. And we have seen that uh, I think you can correct most things if you can find the right bull uh, and match it to the cow. After that question, would you like an intelligent one, please? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, look, John, not, I know you would have an intelligent one. <laughs> look, uh, exceptional results for once a day, and look, not to get away from it, but look, Catherine, you, you mentioned mycoplasma, and look, mm -hmm. there's a, a lot unknown in this country, and maybe you might just go back to, you know, what did you know about it within the herd before you realised you had it, and, you know, what did you do to identify cows in the herd because uh, look there's very little experience on farm uh, within this country um, yes uh, what happened it was the first week in March uh, there was six cows with temperatures of 105 106 and really really six really really sick and lucky enough we had most of the cows were calved at this stage and um, the calving area went anywhere else to push them so um, our vet came out, and he didn't know at the time. Now he just kind of treated him. He said they're very, very sick. Uh, kinda had a suspicion it was uh, took swabs and bloods and um, whatnot, and uh, it was confirmed uh, fairly quick. Um, they were pretty sick, and we had a few more. I, I remember that that evening again because um, I said if there was six. That were that sick, there had to be more um, out in out in the in in the in the sheds that were uh, brewing as well. And sure enough, there was with a couple more that evening. There were just um, one actually died. Um, one had to be put down, and we got another one. Uh, kind of it took it was ages. It took us nearly two months. We just put him into isolation, moved him off down to the other yard, and um, we just uh, had to wait until she was clear of her injections. But what was happening was. It'd be just almost clear, it maybe might be 20 days, the next thing, all of a sudden, about two days before that, the next thing you get a relapse, and you know you had to kind of treat again. It was very disheartening. Um, some cows came in, and once they had this kind of a, a very bad mastitis, and we just uh, kind of out into the drafting yard and just uh, rang the factory before they were even treated, and they did that. And anything that recovered after that, we um, uh, selected them before the breeding. They weren't served that following year, in case they were carriers from that. Uh, we didn't know much about it. Uh, we, we, we had to ring around and we got advice from, um, see, Doreen Corrigan came in there and um, she gave us advice and, and our own vet. Um, we weren't very well, much up to speed, I think, but we, we got the feeling that it's, it's dormant in a lot of herds. And we said, like, what caused it? Where did it come from? We hadn't bought in anything since 06. It was the last time we had purchased anything. We don't buy a bull. Um, you know, and they said, um, uh, well, um, stress caused it. And I said, oh, yeah, ours are really stressed. Um, yeah, they're milled once a day, um, they have a nice cubicle, they're, they have plenty of feed space. Um, so we honestly don't know to this day. Uh, maybe it was dormant in the herd the whole time. Maybe we brought it in ourselves. Um, I, I don't know. But I have talked to one or two others afterwards, and uh, the biggest fear was, was it going to happen again? Were we going to? And we actually lost a sale of, of stock due to it, because um, as well. Um, uh, about 12 months afterwards, I, I just mentioned it and they said, whoa, Michael Hasman. I said, yeah, 
And they said, I mean, straight up with you. He said, oh, no, we, we had that you know, uh, a couple of years ago. He said, no. I said, fair enough. I said, I wouldn't buy if I was after having it and, and buying from another herd in case we buying in. But um, no, it has, it has laid low now. I think we have it um, under control, hopefully. But it is a thing that, you know, and you can't vaccinate for it and you can't treat it. It's just kind of cold kind of thing. You know, manage it, I should say.